Now, an award-winning documentary tracing the rise of the World Scout Movement. The popular image of the scout hiking and camping, forever doing good deeds, is one of the most recognized figures in the world. Despite its familiarity, most people's perception of scouting remains superficial. The scout program provides an opportunity to influence the development of young people. It is an opportunity that has been used and often misused to shape the values they will carry with them as adults. Today, Scouting is a vast organization devoted to promoting brotherhood among the youth of the world. Every four years, thousands of young people convene at the World Scout Jamboree to experience their common humanity. The World Jamboree celebrates decades of Scouting history and tradition that have their origin in the imagination of one unusual man. You come from long distances to meet me. I'm very grateful to you for it. I'm so grateful that I haven't turned on the rain as usual. He was proclaimed chief scout of the world, and for over 30 years he led a devoted multitude of boy scouts and girl guides. But I thank you very much indeed for coming. Best of luck to you. Good camping to you all. He was known as B.P. Robert Stevenson Smythe Baden-Powell was one of the most influential men of his time, idolized by millions as the creator of scouting. Well, I think it almost bordered on reverence. He was the founder, he was the figurehead, uh, everybody had seen his picture, and uh, I remember in 1923 as a cub, we all lined up to meet him, and as he passed, we sort of got a glimpse of a wonderful person. His words were phased in words that somehow or other seemed to attract boys. I know he sure attracted me as a leader the first time I ever saw him, and you just, your heart just went out to him. Hello, you boy in the corner there. You ought to be a boy scout. You're a fine-looking fella, and I know you would make a jolly good backwoodsman by the look of you. You're ugly enough anyway. And you girl there, no, I don't mean you. I mean the pretty one behind you. You ought to be a girl guide, you know. Oh, you are one? Oh, I beg your pardon. That's quite right. Now go on and tell all your pals to come and be girl guides like you. I'm very glad to see you there. Thank you all. Good luck to you. And I wish you and me meet again. Thank you. Baden-Powell created scouting as a child's kingdom to prepare youth for the trials of the adult world and to allow adults to escape them. The scout program grew from BP's unique ability to understand the needs of young people. I think it was a slightly schizophrenic thing, uh, the one side of him being the eternal child that never grew up, and the other, and he was very aware of it, being the adult, the experience of life, and the genius of the man was the fact that he could blend the two together and then feed it back to the young people again. Baden-Powell was a man of great complexity. The first half of his life, he was a dedicated British soldier, yet he created one of the world's foremost peace movements. He looked on life as a grand game, and he played it masterfully to satisfy his driving ambition 
an ambition ingrained in him from an early age. His mother was a true Victorian matriarch, determined that her children would excel. When Robert was 19, he wanted to become an actor or a missionary, but his mother intervened. At her insistence, he wrote the cavalry examinations and stood second out of 700 applicants. In 1876, he joined his regiment on the frontier of the British Empire. The soldiers of our creed are linked in friendly tether. A part of the sea, they fight and fall together. Till every mother's son prepared to fight and fall is the enemy of one, the enemy of all is the enemy of one, the enemy of all is. BP thrived on the military life. Most of his early adult years were spent in India and Africa, maintaining Britain's colonial dominance. He was an ambitious and talented young officer who cleverly orchestrated his career and waltzed his way through the ranks of the British cavalry. BP often drew attention to himself as leading player of the regimental light opera, but socially he remained a loner. Baden-Powell's first love was a solitary life pursuing his own adventures. By the mid-1890s, he had achieved a considerable reputation as a cavalry scout. The challenges and dangers that were part of scouting allowed him to escape the regimentation of military life. Never one to pass up an opportunity, Baden-Powell compiled his thoughts on scouting into a training manual for soldiers. To ensure his talents were recognized, he sent autographed copies to every important British commander. By the age of 40, he was a full colonel, the very image of the pride of the British Empire. It's greatly to his credit that he is an Englishman. He is an Englishman. As the 19th century drew to a close, England was the wealthiest and most powerful nation on earth. Britannia ruled the waves, and her queen, Victoria, reigned over a third of the world's population. The British were certain their empire would last for a thousand years. But in the fall of 1899, the small South African Republic of the Transvaal shattered the empire's facade of invincibility. The Boer homesteaders were determined to rid their country of Britain's colonial influence. When the war began, the British expected to win in a matter of weeks, but their overly regimented troops were no match for the Boer commandos. The first months of the South African War were a disaster for the British, except for one peculiar episode, the Siege of Mafeking. Baden-Powell positioned his men in the small town of Mafeking, Within days, 9,000 Boer troops surrounded his garrison. But they did not launch an all-out attack. The Boer strategy was to bombard the British and wait for them to give in. The siege of Mafeking had begun. It was a battle of endurance which Baden-Powell turned into a game of deception and bluff. To trick the Boers, he had his men dig minefields sown with dummy mines. He created the illusion of a large force by frequently moving his troops from one outpost to another. To relieve his weary soldiers, the boys of the town were enlisted into a cadet corps to run messages and provide sentry duty. He kept up morale by organizing a series of Sunday concerts with himself as ringmaster. The British held musical comedies while the Boers looked on from the hills. From a military standpoint, the siege of Mafeking was insignificant, but it had an undeniable effect on the people of England. Realizing the public longed for a hero, the British tabloids sensationalized BP's antics into epic proportions. 
Baden Powell was seen as a symbol of British courage and heroism. Unknown to BP, he was becoming a national celebrity, and the defense of Mafeking a rallying point for the Empire. Saving the town became a national obsession. Volunteers flocked into the military. Back in Mafeking, there was little to get excited about. The siege settled into a tedious routine. The Boers gradually lost interest in the town, and most of their men were sent to more important action. By the spring of 1900, the war began to turn to the British. Thousands of troops were arriving daily, and the race was on to save the defenders of Mafeking. Finally, after 216 days of the siege, a relief force reached the town. And when the news hit London, Baden-Powell became the hero of the British Empire. Hurrah, hurrah, let us laugh and sing. God bless Powell and the lads at Mafia King. Cheer, 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 let the joy bells ring. Shout, 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 relief at Mafia King. Say, 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 oh, what Britons do, who fight for dear old England and the red, white, and blue. As a result of his immense popularity, BP was promoted to the rank of Major General. But his performance at Mafia King had earned him the mistrust of his superiors. They resented the notoriety he attracted while other men were dying in battle and felt it foolish he had been trapped there in the first place. A few months after the siege, BP was relieved of his active command. Although his fame never faded in the public eye, the hero of Mafeking found himself relegated to increasingly ceremonial roles. In 1903, Baden Powell was brought home to assume the position of Inspector General of Cavalry. But the England he returned to was entering a period of profound disillusionment. The military embarrassments of the Boer War left many Britons with the fear that the Empire was in decline from within. One popular theory traced the roots of national decay to the boyhoods of British citizens. At the turn of the century, there were several groups dedicated to building character in boys and young men, the next generation of empire builders. The largest was the Boys' Brigade, which often asked BP to attend their public demonstrations. The brigade was created to instill discipline and true Christian manliness in boys through military drill and Bible study. While BP was impressed with the brigade's purpose and patriotic zeal, he was not impressed by the regimentation of its methods. Baden Powell felt that a more imaginative program would attract more boys and go much further in building character in them. The hero of Mafeking found himself in a unique position to influence the youth of the day. A popular boys' magazine had run a series of articles based on his army manual, Aids to Scouting. The stories described his adventures as a frontier scout, and many boys emulated BP in their own scouting games. It occurred to Baden-Powell that some form of organized scout training would benefit boys and the Empire. This insight came to him at a critical point in his life. In 1907, his term as Inspector General of Cavalry had come to an end. At the age of 50, Lieutenant General Baden-Powell was faced with retirement to the reserves. Acting, writing and fine art were all careers he was contemplating. Without any firm idea of what his future would hold, he began to adapt aids to scouting into a handbook for training boys. Baden-Powell wanted the scout training to operate on two levels, the practical and the playful. To the boys, scouting was to appear to be an adventurous game, a game that would disguise its character-building purpose. To develop his new manual for good citizenship, BP researched contemporary theories of child development and borrowed extensively from the programs of existing youth groups. 
but mostly he relied on his own insight into the behavior of youth. Baden-Powell realized that boys instinctively gang together, often creating their own secret rites and rituals. He also knew that within the group, a leader would naturally emerge. BP felt that by influencing the leaders of the upcoming generation, he could influence the destiny of Britain. Baden-Powell's perception of what would appeal to boys was deeply rooted in his own childhood. As a boy, he attended Charterhouse, one of England's finest schools. He was among the privileged elite who were destined to become the leaders of their generation. But Baden-Powell made little use of his scholastic opportunity. Although he was considered to be a bright enough boy, he often fell asleep in class. He found his lessons to be complete drudgery and school a confining prison. But after school, in a nearby woods, out of bounds to students, he found an ideal setting for his lively imagination. Alone in the woods, he lived the life of a frontiersman and spied on his teachers from the treetops. His own experience of youthful independence was injected into scouting. In July of 1907, he was ready to put his program to the test. He decided to conduct an experimental camp at the site of one of his own childhood adventures. Brown Sea Island was rumored to be the hiding place of smugglers and pirates. As a boy, BP had sailed around it with his brothers often sneaking ashore to search for buried treasure. Now the island would provide an ideal location for the exploits of the first boy scouts. There were 10 boys from the working class, like from the boys' brigade, and there was 10 come from the colleges. You see, there was Lord Rodney's three sons, there was two Evans Loams, there was two Humphrey Nobles. You see, they, they were college boys. We all mixed together well. Well, I think it was a very happy time. We were just 13, 14 years old. We began to look around much more and uh, notice other people and not really lived uh, anything like such a closed life as we did. It was a very narrow life. But for scouting, meeting other people, learning things, really opened the world to us. BP brought the boys together and formed them into four patrols. He wanted scouting to appeal to all boys and promote harmony in England's stratified social system. He instructed the boys in camping, life-saving, and patriotism, all taught through stories and games. But the highlight for each patrol was the overnight camp they spent by themselves. That night, the boys had to make their own biscuits, scout style, in someone's coat. And when we got about 100 yards off of the castle along the sand, we pitched there for the, to do this. And we got down, I got down on the sand with this, with this coat and this flower and was mixing it up. And you know, there was millions of little sand hoppers jumping into it. So you know, I, I kept on mixing and mixing them in and rolled them up, made them and cooked them. They ate it, but I didn't eat none of it. Because I, I see all these little things jumping in it. I couldn't fancy that, could you? It's terrible, wasn't it? <laughs> the scout training captivated the boys and they all joined into BP's new game with enthusiasm. But it was BP's unique way of relating to them that impressed the boys the most. He never put us in a position where we felt awkward or silly. He was always there to help. He was at the back of you. And this is where he brought the best out of really all the boys, I'm quite sure. Well, he never tried to ride the high horse over us or nothing. Never, there was no bullying or nothing. No restrictions put on us at all. He absolutely put us on our honor, and that was it. After the Brown Sea Camp, Baden-Powell was ready to take his Boy Scout program to the public. He struck a deal to release his book through one of England's most powerful publishers, Cyril Arthur Pearson. BP would get his Boy Scouts launched, and Pearson would acquire a new addition to his publishing empire. In February of 1908, Scouting for Boys went to press. The book came out in a series of installments. 
and boys bought them up as fast as they hit the shelves. They read of a new child's kingdom and camping adventures under the stars. BP addressed the book directly to boys in language they could understand. Within its pages, he carefully diagrammed every detail of what it meant to be a scout. The training was presented as an imaginative game that any boy could play. BP challenged the boys to join the Brotherhood of Scouts, to take its oath and live by its laws. He gave them their own motto, be prepared. Across England, pants were cut into scout shorts and broomsticks became scout staves. The scouting craze spread out of control. Trees were felled in city parks. Campfires dotted the landscape. Boys formed their own patrols and roamed the countryside searching for good deeds to perform. Before scouting for boys, they sought heroes to look up to. Now they could be heroes themselves. something quite fresh to us as small boys. Scouting was a game and an adventure. And the idea of spending much more time in the open to get to camp in lighting fires, cooking your own meals, it, it, was, uh, it, it was really something new. Baden-Powell's carefully contrived program to build better Britons grew at an incredible rate. Within months, over 100,000 youths were registered as Boy Scouts. By the fall of 1909, the Scouts were recognized as an important and zealous social movement. BP decided to show off his creation with a rally at the Crystal Palace in London. Among the 10,000 Boy Scouts gathered that day was a small but conspicuous group. Suddenly, we saw a figure coming towards us. And of course, we knew at once that it was Baden Pearl. So we scrambled down the bank, and we made a line, and he came up and said to the patrol leader, and what the dickens do you think you are doing here? And the patrol leader said, we want to be Girl Scouts. And he replied almost instantly, oh no, it's only for the boys. Well, then we broke our line, and we gathered round him, and we said, oh, please, please, something for the girls. BP had not planned on anything for the girls. He feared that including them in scouting would turn many boys away from the program. However, he did feel that women had an important role to play as efficient homemakers and cheery companions. So he created a separate movement for them. BP handed the task of leading the girl guides to his sister, a 50-year-old spinster who had little experience beyond the confines of her mother's parlor. Agnes Baden-Powell fashioned the girl guides after the Victorian ideal of womanhood and titled her handbook, What Girls Can Do to Help Build Up the Empire. Emancipation for women was a long way off. In the early days of the movement, few of the problems BP faced were as easily handled as the girl guide issue. 
he was constantly criticized for encouraging militarism in scouting. In Scouting for Boys, Baden-Powell asked the scouts to learn how to shoot and insisted they always obey orders. Scouts were also to be prepared to give their lives to their country. Like many Edwardians, BP believed that Germany might one day threaten England. This concern was part of his motivation to create scouting. BP maintained the program's purpose was to build character, not soldiers. But many scoutmasters saw themselves as make-believe generals and came equipped with swords and pistols. BP attempted to rid the movement of these excesses by establishing local committees to monitor Boy Scout leaders and activities. But to his critics, the scout staves still resembled surrogate rifles, and Baden-Powell remained a general. Suspicions of militarism in scouting were not easily dismissed. Perhaps the most bruising problem of all was the ridicule suffered by the boys themselves. Scouts soon learned that those who are open about their beliefs are also open to attack. would cross class boundaries. But not all boys wanted to wear short pants and do good deeds. The principles of scouting were most suited to the values of middle class youth. to influence the young men of Britain. Suddenly, a new sphere of influence opened to him. Scouting for boys had emigrated overseas and translations appeared in dozens of languages. Parents of all nations wanted to impart the values of scouting to their children. It was a solemn occasion when a boy took the scout oath. He promised on his honor to be loyal to God and country and to obey the scout law. A scout's duty was to be useful and help others. A scout was to be a friend to all and a brother to fellow scouts. The program was seen as a potent formula to mold useful citizens. Nations from around the globe were inviting the founder of scouting to inspect their boys. In 1912, Baden-Powell embarked on his first world tour to promote the growth of scouting. The ship would take him first to the Caribbean and then on to New York. BP expected to spend the time preparing for his tour of America. On the second day at sea, he met the daughter of a wealthy English gentleman. Olive St. Clair Soames was a shy and naive 22-year-old when she was introduced to the founder of scouting. Instantly, and for the first time in his 54 years, BP fell madly in love. Remarkably, so did Miss Soames. To Olive and BP, it seemed they were destined for each other. They shared common interests and even had the same birth date, although they were born 32 years apart. BP felt it was improper for a distinguished British general to be seen swooning over a girl half his age, so they kept their romance a secret. They hid love notes to each other and rose before dawn for intimate meetings. They wanted to marry when the ship reached Jamaica, but decided to wait until the completion of his tour. Olive returned to England, and BP sailed on to America. They had been together for only three weeks.
Scouting crossed the Atlantic within months of its start in England, and the Boy Scouts of America were incorporated in 1910. A single scout from Brooklyn bearing a letter from President Taft was among those who greeted Baden-Powell. The President invited BP to begin his inspection of scouting from the steps of the White House. It was an offer he could hardly refuse. Baden-Powell wanted scouting to be larger than life, so he attracted support from men who were larger than life. BP had cleverly referred to the exploits of Teddy Roosevelt in scouting for boys, and the former president had adopted scouting as one of his pet causes. Beyond extolling the benefits of outdoor life, BP's program coincided with many values of the time. Scouting reinforced the traditional American virtue of service to the community. BP skillfully camouflaged the chore by presenting civic duty as the challenge to perform a daily good turn. It was one of the attractions that made scouting contagious. I recall one uh, incident that illustrates that one day in school, I was in the sixth or seventh grade, a notice came in for all boys in the room who were scouts to report at the office. There was some special occasion, some reason for that. Every one of us got up and left the room with the exception of one lad. He was from a rather prominent family too, but he hadn't joined the scouts. He did shortly after that. In a nation which made patriotism a religion, the scout program was praised for the love of country it instilled in youth. Scouting also molded efficient individuals who respected rules and worked well with others, important qualities in progressive era America. Like most scout associations, the Boy Scouts of America attracted the sponsorship of the country's wealthiest patrons. A national headquarters was established in New York and a centralized administration installed. Corporate America created corporate scouting. Prominent in the Boy Scouts of America hierarchy was a well-known naturalist, Ernest Thompson Seton. Born in England and raised in Canada, he built a reputation in America for his work among youth. In 1902, he wrote a series of articles that encouraged boys to learn the ways of the Red Indian. The result was a small organization, Seton's Woodcraft Indians. Seton published a manual for his tribes to follow two years before scouting for boys was released. And now he accused Baden-Powell of stealing his ideas. Seton's book described animal names and cries for the boys' patrols and taught woodcraft techniques through practice and games. The woodcraft Indians won medals for achievement and lived by their own set of laws, all elements common to scouting. Baden-Powell openly admitted that parts of his program were based on other men's work. At one banquet in his honor, he even referred to himself as merely the uncle of the Boy Scout movement. But there was no doubt that BP was the founder and catalyst of scouting. Baden-Powell's scout succeeded where the Woodcraft Indians failed. Seton urged boys to return to primitive nobility in defiance of modernization. He went against the mainstream of American society, which had completely embraced the Boy Scout program. Developments in the United States were paralleled wherever BP went. His tour took him to the Pacific Islands, the Orient, New Zealand, Australia, and Africa. But scouting was not the only thing on his mind. Throughout his tour, he and Olive maintained their romance by mail. Olive waited six months for BP to return to England. When he finally arrived at her parents' home, he gave her a Boy Scout ring to make their engagement official. Olive was sure of her love for BP, but not quite so enthusiastic about the adulation that came with him. When she heard that the Army, the Navy, and the Scouts had planned a great display at their wedding, she asked BP to elope. 
They compromised and took their vows in a small family ceremony. On the very day of their anniversary, Olive gave birth to a son, the first of their three children. They named him Peter after their favorite play, Peter Pan. The events of the past few years were a period of remarkable change for Baden-Powell. In the wake of his world tour, he reappraised his view of scouting's ultimate purpose. By 1914, BP began to perceive of the Boy Scout program as a way of fostering brotherhood among the youth of the world. It was an aspiration that was shattered by the horror of the First World War. The same intense nationalism which had led so many nations to adopt the scout program also led to the First World War. When fighting broke out, Baden-Powell asked his scout leaders to mobilize their senior boys for immediate action. In Baden-Powell's view, the men of peace-loving countries were bound by duty to defend against those nations who failed to share the Brotherhood ideal. Among the first wave of volunteers were 150,000 former scouts who quickly learned the harsh realities of trench warfare. Defending the ideals of peace became Baden-Powell's obsession throughout the war years. He wrote two books, Marksmanship for Boys and Quick Training for War. On the home front, he had his scouts run messages for the war office. They filled in wherever they could, replacing men who had left for the front. They guarded bridges and patrolled the coast. Some even lost their lives under enemy fire. When the war began, the Boy Scouts were America's largest uniformed force. They proved their value during the Liberty Loan Drives, raising over $350 million for the war effort. But the image of the Scout, always prepared to serve his country, was a useful propaganda tool as well. This slaughter of World War I lasted for more than four years. Millions of volunteers died in the trenches. And when they were gone, millions more were conscripted to take their place. When the vast power of America was added to the Western Allies, Germany capitulated. The Great War, the war to end all wars, concluded as pointlessly as it had begun. left untouched by the war, but few people were more affected than Baden-Powell. There was an eerie quiet in the scout meeting places. During the growth of scouting, BP made close friendships with hundreds of young men. Now they were gone. BP never denied that it was the duty of men in peace-loving nations to defend their countries. But now he took it upon himself to ensure that the youth of the world would never again have to respond to a call to arms. He refocused his own mission and the purpose of scouting throughout the world to promote peace and brotherhood among nations. 
A war-weary world turned to the scout movement with the hope of breeding peace into future generations. It was a challenge BP and the scouts were equal to. In 1920, Baden-Powell convened the first World Scout Jamboree, a celebration of the potential of youth. Jamboree would bring together scouts from around the world to experience their common humanity. BP had little faith in the League of Nations. His hopes turned instead to the young. He felt he could influence the boys and impress his moral code on their generation. Scout mythology records that on the last day of the Jamboree, a single boy approached Baden-Powell and gave him the title Chief Scout of the World. In reality, BP had suggested this distinction for himself years earlier. The post-war years brought an important development for the Girl Guides as well. Olive Baden-Powell established herself as an enthusiastic leader and was acclaimed World Chief Guide. Throughout the 20s and 30s, the Baden-Powells traveled the world to promote the growth of the scout and guide movements. Together, they campaigned to encourage international brotherhood. BP had a very clear purpose for his scouts. I think he really did feel that scouting could expand throughout the world because what he was saying to people is, it doesn't matter whether you're Chilean, it doesn't matter whether you're Mexican, it doesn't matter whether you're Indonesian, Australian, British. There was no reason why a moral code shouldn't extend across frontiers to foreign countries. Because he'd lived in that sort of environment all his life. He really did believe that if he could get enough people to be scouts in other countries, following the same laws as each other, that there must eventually be world peace. Baden-Powell's vision for scouting was not unusual for the times. In the decade after the war, plans for peace were greeted with optimism. BP's efforts were among the most promising. In 10 years, his following had increased tenfold, surpassing one million. They represented every race and religion of the world, and they were eager to follow the word of the chief scout. And now I would ask you to listen to your promise and think it over as you've never thought before, you promise on my honor, your honor, mind you, to do my best, to do my duty to God and to the king, and to obey the scout law. Will you do your best? Answer me. When I was about 12 years old, I realized that my father was famous. So I think that really impressed me enormously. That, that's dad, that's just dad, and look at them all. All of them praising him like this and cheering him. And, uh, well, it's, this is remarkable because he's really only just dad to us. Now well into his 70s, BP enjoyed the exuberant companionship of his son Peter and daughters Heather and Betty. When the chief scout relaxed, he remained true to form. If he tried to uh, help us to develop every talent we had in the same way that he was encouraging other people's children to do the same. jolly useful for him having us because he was able to try out ideas on his own children if they worked with us well then they'd work with other people's kids and there's no doubt at all that his greatest joy was having a family life my father and mother were the most devoted couple you could imagine mum rather ruled him in a way over his uh, physical welfare just as though he was a small boy, and he used to behave like a small boy, and he'd pre pretend to cry and grouse and say, I don't want to put on a sweater, I'm not cold. And she'd say, now come along, darling, behave yourself. And they'd have some sort of a silly play as though, uh, as though he was just a naughty small boy. They were, they were great fun in that way. They 
played up to us in the most amusing way together. Now I'll say a word to you who are parents. We try to make these boys and girls into what we call the three H's. That is, happy, healthy, helpful citizens. And you will find if you send your boys and girls to the scout or guide movement, we help the schools. They teach them knowledge in order to succeed in their examinations and so on, and we teach them character so that they may succeed in life. <laughs> Twenty-five years after its founding, the appeal of the scout movement was undiminished among young people and their parents. The novelty of the program had long passed, but scouting proved timeless in its appeal. Now the sons and daughters of the first generation of scouts and guides renewed the movement's vitality. By the mid-thirties, scouting was permanently woven into the fabric of society. That was hard work getting this bag. Scouting was recognized as an effective method to fulfill the potential of youth. The theme chosen for our Boy Scout Week observance, building a stronger generation, is thoroughly worthwhile. And we should be especially thankful for a youth movement that seeks to preserve simple fundamentals like physical strength, mental alertness, and moral straightness, a movement to support the ideals of peace. <laughs> Baden Powell's drive for peace reached a crescendo in 1933 at the Fourth World Jamboree in Godelow, Hungary. It was scouting's largest celebration with over 25,000 participants from 32 countries. The 20s had been a period of prosperity and hope. Now all nations were overwhelmed by the Great Depression. The darkness of totalitarianism was descending on the world as the scouts celebrated their festival of youth. Several months before the Jamboree, a thousand scouts representing Germany had registered to attend. They never left home. Hitler became Chancellor of Germany, he banned the Boy Scout movement. Membership in the new Hitler Youth was compulsory. Hitler's program for young people was modeled directly on scouting, but with a different purpose. His principal aim was to indoctrinate the upcoming generation with Nazi ideology. In his version of the Scout Oath, the Hitler Youth promised to sacrifice their lives at the whim of the Fuhrer. The Hitler Youth were the future of Germany, and they numbered eight million, more than double the amount of scouts in the rest of the world. Baden-Powell intensified his drive to promote world peace. I've heard since I came to Sydney, there are some people still talk about being a military movement. Well, that's all humbug, because we've now spread to 45 different countries about the world, 
It's a movement of absolutely of peace and goodwill among men. And all the different countries have taken it up in that spirit. And I suppose that amongst our three millions of Boy Scouts and Girl Guides, there's not one who doesn't feel the bond of friendship and comradeship and brotherhood with those of other countries. This sense of brotherhood was very real among those who were scouts, but the movement had not reached everyone. Those who did join eventually discovered that the laws they followed were not easily applied to the trials of adulthood. For every boy who never grew up, there were thousands more who did. Baden-Powell failed to change the world, but his movement enriched the lives of millions, and his ambitious drive to promote peace had not gone unnoticed. Knighted by the king in 1912, and made Lord Baden-Powell in 1929, he received virtually every honor the world could bestow. In 1939, at the age of 82, Baden-Powell was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, but that year no award was granted. And this year in the Republic of France, the Boy Scout movement has become stronger than at any time in its history. Today, among all the people of Europe, None is more determined that the traditions that have long been theirs, liberty, equality, and fraternity, shall be inherited by their children. Oh, he was shattered. Um, there's no doubt about it. He was very, very disillusioned and very upset. But by then, he was a very old man, and he realized that this was beyond him, that all he'd worked for was just falling into decay and ruins. He must have been very broken, because it appeared that he was, um, by the way he went to Kenya, by the way he didn't really wish to come back to Europe. About to leave the foggy shores of Britain, Lord Baden-Powell. I wish who you were going with me, a lot of you not only to see the place, but to settle there in that happy country. So come along in your thoughts if you can't come of yourself. And you'll remember that there are crowds of your brother scouts out there ready to welcome you. And so from fog into sunshine went this amazing veteran who never seems to grow any older. Baden Powell spent the last two years of his life at his retirement home in Nairi, Kenya. He never lost faith in his movement, and he never stopped urging the Scouts to renew their brotherhood when the war was over. I can remember his peacefulness. He was very peaceful by that time, rather resigned to being out of things and leaving things to other people. Um, guilty at not being in it, but realizing that, of course, at his age, he couldn't do it. Um, he wasn't physically very comfortable by that time. He had several ailments that were um, rather uncomfortable. And so I think he was really getting very ready to go and very contented to leave to others the job that he'd started, realizing that they would be able to carry on very well indeed, thanks to his inspiration. The program will be discussed in BBC One's Open Air tomorrow morning at 11.35.